Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us in the locker room today. I'm Alan Locker. A fan, Amy Kaiser Sanders, told me that today would have been the 39th anniversary of our beloved Bob and Kim, and how appropriate that we have Emmy Award winning executive producer Lawrence Queso here to look back at his time producing over 1,700 episodes of As the World Turns from 1988 to 1995. After three seasons at the Berkshire Theater Festival in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, Lawrence joined CBS in Los Angeles to work on the development of comedy and drama series. In New York, he worked as the VP of Daytime Programs and the Director of Specials, and was also the VP of Programs for the startup of a little channel called the Disney Channel. Today, Lawrence is Executive Director of the Klein Memorial Auditorium Foundation after having served on their board of directors for five years. Please help me welcome to the locker locker room Emmy Award winner, Lawrence Queso. Hey, Lawrence. Hello, Alan. Thank you so much for doing this today. Absolutely, my pleasure. Fan, fans are, are thrilled to hear from you. Um, so I, I, I'm thrilled to have you. Um, will you tell everyone what the 1934 Telecommunication Act is and why it brought you to your current job at the Klein Memorial Auditorium? Sure. The uh, That act was the first time that Congress actually got involved and tried to put some kind of order into the fledgling industry that was broadcasting. Of course, then it was just radio. But it was such running amok with charlatans, selling phony medicines on radio advertisements that they felt they had to put in some kind of standards. And so they wrote a whole telecommunications act, established the Federal Communications Commission. And uh, one of the clauses that struck me when I was a student at Syracuse and studying broadcasting was that broadcasters should serve in, quote, the public interest. And that has always guided me in my career in that everything I do, I want to make sure that it's for the audience above all else. Wow, that's amazing. What are you charged with at the Klein as executive director? What are you responsible for? Well, the Klein is an 84-year-old Art Deco performing arts center. We're one of seven remaining Broadway-sized stages in Connecticut. Wow. And we are a true performing arts center. We're one of the few venues that uh, presents all the performing arts. We have resident companies of opera. The symphony is rehearsing on stage right now. I had to close the door to my audience. Uh, otherwise, you'd have Beethoven's eighth bleeding through. Um, and uh, we have a children's choir, a youth orchestra, um, several dance companies. Anyway, uh, and we do the Bridgeport Film Festival. But um, as executive director, I am in charge of the nonprofit. I do all hiring, budgeting, programming, you name it. Um, I'm involved because we have a very small staff. We're four full-time workers and, and a number of part-time workers. Wow. And we are busy. When I first joined the Klein on the board in 19, I mean, in 2009, the Klein was only in use 65 days. I took over as executive director in 2014, so now 10 years. Uh, in 2023, we only had nine off days where this building wasn't in use. So we've built up a business and we have about 70,000 patients coming a year. That's incredible. Um, and 84 years is incredible for a theater. You know, that is something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, you told me backstage that you had somebody from Oakdale just there. I did. We had uh, Scott Bryce who lives in the area, and I've stayed in touch with Scott all these years. Uh, he came and he staged a master class for our after-school program. We run a tuition-free after-school arts education program for Bridgeport Middle and High Schoolers. And so he did a whole 90-minute session on acting for the camera. He brought in cameras and uh, monitors so that everyone could see on the screen and did a whole master class of it. Wow. Other connection to Oakdale here in this building is that in the later years of her life, our good friend Kathy Hayes 
who was a Bridgeport resident and lived up the hill from me, had season tickets to the symphony. It was her favorite, favorite activity. And she had her known seat and I gave her VIP parking so she could park right outside the door and come in. And she came to five concerts a year. Wow. You know, since you, you brought Kathy up, what, what do you remember about Kathy? <laughs> uh, one of the most passionately committed to her work that I've ever run into, uh, a sweetheart of a woman, a woman with real depth who, had she wanted to go that way, and I don't think she ever would have, she could have even been a writer because she had very sharp instincts. And I always could trust her instincts in terms of approaching a scene in writing. But she was a dream to work with. She and Don and Larry Brigman and Eileen Fulton, I mean, they were a core that just had been together all those years, such professionals, such a marvel to watch their approach to work, none, nonetheless to work with them. But um, as, as a fan, Bob and Kim were everything to me, you know, and then to have the opportunity to work with them was really, uh, you know, a, a blessing, you know, really. Don is one of the funniest men I have ever met in my entire life. So quick. <laughs> I still remember the story meeting we had when we decided to put the two of them together. Oh, wow. It was a big risk because uh, we had done so much story with each of them apart. But um, to finally make that decision to put them together and many people, including Procter & Gamble, when they started to syndicate the show overseas in Europe, the starting point was the wedding show of Bob and Kim because we felt that that marked the beginning of the new and the rest chapter of that show. Oh, wow. I love that. Well, uh, we, we, we're going to come back to Oakdale. Um, you were 17 years old and you had one burning desire. Will you tell everyone what that was and, and where did that desire come from? Uh, it, my burning desire was to work at CBS and program development. And the reason is... But at 17, that's such a specific... <laughs> Yes. Well, because I can remember the date. Um, in March of, when was it? 1967. CBS put on a special called Mark Twain Tonight. It was Hal Holbrook's off-Broadway show. David Susskind produced it and he put it on television. And I watched it that night and it just amazed me. I knew Twain's work because I had, of course, read Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, but that show seemed like something of showmanship and a departure from what you normally see on network television that I said any network that could put that on is an organization I want to be with. And it made me a Twain fanatic. The next day at school, I checked out his autobiography of the school library. And I've done a lifelong, uh, really, uh, I have a full collection of just about everything he ever printed, and I've read every bit of it. In fact, Monday, Monday, instead of looking at the eclipse, I pulled out my old printed in 1901 edition of Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, because it has a chapter about the lead character fooling the people in King Arthur's Court who had were burning him at the stake. I don't know if you remember the book, but he tra time travels back to King Arthur's days and they Merlin competes with him and wants him burned at the stake. They're lighting the fire. And he remembers that that day in history was a solar eclipse. So he told them all, I will destroy the world. And sure enough, the eclipse hits right at that moment. King Arthur flips out. Merlin is arrested. And that character talked about Bridgeport, Connecticut, because he was from East Hartford, Connecticut. So since I'm in Bridgeport, I felt I got to read that chapter on the eclipse day. Uh, what I'm what I'm really amazed at is is truly it's the power of, you know, your eyes coming upon that special and, and really changing the course of your life. 
Well, it did. And I, uh, the way I got to my career was senior year at Syracuse. That was, I knew that uh, if I was ever going to do this and work with actors and directors, I should take acting courses. So I did. And one of the projects was to do an oral interpretation. So I ripped off uh, Hal Holbrook and I did 20 minutes of uh, Mark Twain tonight. And uh, they so enjoyed it that they asked me to come back on my own the following weekend and stage it. And we sold out the house. And then I was invited by a Syracuse professor to go to Stockbridge to the Berkshire Theater Festival to work as an intern where we would work three hours at the theater and the rest of the time we would do plays. And he wanted me to do the full Mark Twain Tonight uh, play. So I did. It was one of the three plays we performed that summer. And three weeks into the season, my job at the, in the, as an intern was uh, I was put in the marketing department. And I just started writing radio scripts and booking time and all this because that's what I had studied. And the general director of the theater had just left the job of vice president of program of development at CBS in Los Angeles. So here was the man who had held the job that I <laughs> wanted to get into. And I was getting to do Mark Twain because Mark Twain had gotten me there. And so I returned the next two years and I was company manager. He hired me on the spot as company manager. And I did that for three years to working with him on picking the plays and casting them. And, uh, and then I moved out to Hollywood and I wrote a 40 page analysis of every show on the three primetime networks, sent it to the three network presidents and CBS hired me in development. That is incredible. I would love to read that. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be an incredible document. Um, and, and you, you know, you got the job in development and you helped to develop, you know, to name a few, WKRP in Cincinnati, Alice, yep. Dallas, White Shadow. Can you uh, share a little about each? Sure. Um, well, start with Alice. That was the very first pilot I worked on. And of course, that was the adaptation from Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And we had a hard time casting it. And CBS had put a holding deal with uh, Linda Lavin, and they hadn't found anything right for her. So at the last minute, we plugged her into that. And I remember the night of the taping, she was so nervous, really, truly shaking nervous. And uh, she pulled it off. What was great was, and this is where a development executive can make a big change. Now, remember, I was low man on the totem pole at that point, but Frank Barton, who was my boss, at the last run through, he just ripped into the writers and he said, this is boring. He said, you have got to put some physical comedy into this. And so overnight, they rewrote and they restaged. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but from the opening, they had things like uh, Beth Holloway's uh, character, Vera, opening up the straw container and all the straws blew up and things. Well, they put all that in and it helped the show. And sure enough, uh, when the show went to air, they let the writers go and they hired Lucille Ball's writers from I Love Lucy. And that was the physical comedy writing for a female protagonist. And it was the same formula. Mel was the excitable male like Desi was. Yeah. And the Ditsies were Lucy and Ethel. And you can throw in Flo to, to go with it. But it was the same formula. And that's what transformed that show. White Shadow was actually developed. We developed it with Bruce Paltrow as a comedy. Because oh. we had worked with Bruce on comedy pilots that had never sold. He had never done a dramatic thing in his life. And Bob Silverling, who was our director of comedy, got promoted to vice president of drama. And he came up with the idea and he came and asked us. He said, do you think you'd release it so that I could turn it into an hour long drama? And Bruce went along with it. And that's what set Bruce up. And I don't think he wrote comedy ever again because then he did St. Elsewhere after White Shadow. <laughs> uh, but it was all because Bob Sibling figured it out and, and thought it would make a better hour-long drama. Um, 
Wow. Dallas was just one of those things where we had been looking for to put a primetime soap on the air. One hadn't been on since Peyton Place. Be and before you continue, you know, and, and before daytime, um, were you a soap watcher in any way? Only as a student to get my job at CBS. When I was writing my whole analysis, I spent some time looking at the daytime shows so that I could get a familiarity with them. But no, I wasn't a regular viewer because I was always off doing other things. Yeah, I was so, just curious. Continue yeah. about Dallas. Yeah, I was just curious on that. Uh, so Dallas uh, um, was from David Jacobs. And uh, actually, David had pitched Knott's Landing to us two times before this, before Dallas. And we had rejected it each time because we didn't think it had any real pizzazz to it. It was really just a concept of five couples living in a California cul-de-sac, getting into each other's lives. Um, but when he walked in with Dallas, we instantly saw the good versus evil. It was kind of East of Eden, really. It's the two brothers <laughs> fighting. And that, that was classic CBS programming. And so we went forward with that. First only bought six episodes. And uh, oh, wow. It immediately caught on. They put it on as a spring show. It had a str spring tryout in uh, March, and it wow. worked. And so then it went on. Um, and WKRP in Cincinnati, the best story about that is, uh, well, two things. That's one I will, while I was still low man on the totem pole, that's the one show I can kind of take some credit for because nobody else wanted to put it on the air because they were fearful of it being in unfairly compared to Mary Tyler Moore's show. It was from Mary's company and it was a gang comedy in a media outlet, just like Mary Tyler Moore. Right. And Mary was just coming off the air and this was coming along and they felt this is not going to be fair. What sold me on it was when we develop a pilot, we always ask the writers to supply six storylines and six scripts so that if it gets picked up, we have a running start to get the series going and then we the development department turn it over to the current programming folks so we did that and uh in that six was the one that's everybody's favorite the thanksgiving episode where uh, they did a promotion of uh, dropping turkeys out of a helicopter during thanksgiving as a giveaway that was based on a real incident that hugh wilson the creator of wkrp had lived at a little station in South Carolina where he worked. His marketing guy put that promotion together. <laughs> it was a disaster because the turkeys couldn't fly and they were splatting all over the parking lot. That's wild. Oh my God, I mean, such great shows you worked on. How did you make the transition from LA to VP of programming, uh, daytime programming in New York? Well, the, uh, the stopover was, I, I got, promoted back to New York. I was originally from New York and uh, my wife and I, who at the time was Regis Philbin's producer, um, she was at on, ABC. On his Lifetime show or the morning show? Well, she started with Regis on a show called AM Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regis and Sarah Purcell were the hosts and she did that for a few years and then they wanted to do they wanted her to do something similar in the morning on Channel 7 in New York. And we were looking to get back to New York. And so we both went to our bosses the same day after a long agonizing weekend of, should we really do this? And uh, said, you know, if it comes up, even if it's two years from now, we'd love to be considered for a move to New York. And 10 days later on the same day, we got phone calls that, we had jobs in the two, in New York. And so a week later, we were here. And uh, she did do some morning programming, but then she became executive producer of the whole station, all their local programming. And she got the idea of bringing Regis to New York. And I can still remember sitting in our kitchen when she made the call to him. And she had to talk him into it because he didn't really want to give up what he had in Los Angeles. And she said, Regis, you're from New York. You'll be a smash hit here. And she talked him into it. And uh, and he came and she produced his first. I, I mean, I have your wife to thank because that's my 
I was a page at ABC, Lawrence, and my first job out of college, not even, I didn't even have my diploma, was working for Regis and Kathy Lee. Wow. Well, who did she, who was her co the co host then? Was um, Cindy, Garvey? Cindy Garvey, I think. Cindy, when it first launched, and then Kathy yeah. Lee came over. Yeah, right. Cindy well, was well, first. Pat, Pat worked with Cindy and Regis, and then uh, our first son was born, and, and she decided to step away. And uh, wow. Yeah. I mean, incredible. I love that connection. Um, so you're brought to New York and, and into daytime? No, um, I had uh, series development first. And then um, the people in specials uh, wanted to add to the department. And they came to my boss, Alan Wagner, and they said, do you think we could get queso? And he took me out to lunch and he said, they want you to do this. He said, I can't stand in your way. It's probably a good move for you. Um, so I did, and it was a great job. I was director of specials. We did, that was in the heyday of real specials on networks, like the Mark Twain show. But we did cultural documentaries like The Body Human, all the variety shows, award shows, beauty pageants, parades, and special movies that had social themes. And uh, so I worked on those for three years and traveled around the world with specials and learned a lot and had a great time. Then I left from there, the man who had taken me out to lunch to uh, Alan Wagner, who had taken me out to lunch to say, do you want to go into specials, was hired for the creation of the Disney Channel. He was the first president. And he took me out to lunch a second time and asked me if I'd like to be his vice president of programs. So I went to the Disney Channel. And we worked on that for a year. We put together a 10-year plan. We had all the marketing done. And the minute we showed them the kind of money they could make, the Disney Channel was created as a joint partnership between Westinghouse Broadcasting, which had the space on the satellite transponder that Disney desperately needed for distribution, and Disney. When Disney saw the kind of money that they could make through our 10-year plan, they had delayed signing the joint agreement for the entire year we were working there. And finally, one weekend, Westinghouse flew out to California and Disney faced them across the desk and said, we're doing this ourselves. We're buying you out. And that Monday, all the people, all 27 of us at the channel were let go and replaced by Disney people out on the West Coast. So that's how I got to daytime. The day after that was announced that we were leaving, I got a call from Jackie Smith at ABC, who had known my reputation at, a at CBS. And she brought me the lunch at the executive dining hall at ABC and said, would you be interested in daytime? And she said, because I'll instantly hire you as a consultant. And if you like it, we, maybe we can have a job for you. So I started watching their shows and consulting with her. And three months later, I got a call from Bud Grant at CBS. Um, he wanted me in daytime. So I made the move to see, back home to CBS, which was my love, and became director of daytime. And then a couple of years later, became vice president of daytime. I think you're frozen. Alan? Alan? There you are. Okay, I was having for a second. I don't yeah. know how much you got of that. Well, Bud called and brought you over Bud to CBS. Hired me. I was director of daytime, and then two years later, I became vice president of daytime. That's absolutely incredible. So, which means you are responsible for Young and the Restless, Capital, and Light, and As the World Turns at that time. Correct. And then we were developing The Bold and the Beautiful. You, you, yep. you told me backstage that you were developing with Bill Bell, The Bold and the Beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you remember? Like, what were you charged with in coming into daytime? Like, was there any, anything that comes to mind for Guiding Light or World Turns or? Well, the two Procter & Gamble shows were in real trouble, as was Capital. They were not doing well. And... Um, 
when I first was in daytime, I was just in charge of the two New York shows. And uh, so, oh, so my shows, you. so my shows, you were <laughs> Guiding Light and World Turns. Yeah. So we uh, we made a producer change on As the World Turns. We took Bob Calhoun, who had been a producer on Guiding Light, and shifted him over to uh, World Turns. That made all the difference. Guiding Light, we had Pam Long writing, and she was doing very well. She got that show up to number three in the ratings. Yeah. And was- then. Um, my biggest contribution to in those days was we didn't have a dedicated promotion department for daytime. They were the runt of the litter and we would have producer writer du jour doing our promos. So I lobbied hard and I got Susan Banks hired to be the head of daytime promotion. I remember Susan. Susan. She's great. And she's now yeah, writing on it. Yeah. Well, we just giggled through it, but we read every script of the four shows. And I would, we would talk on the phone once a week and trade notes on what scenes we should pull for potential promos. And then she would write the scripts. And we worked very closely that way. And we put together a real department that marketed and promoted daytime i put together a series of uh i got the characters of guiding light and i think young and restless to do um 20 second things about their character talking directly to the audience hi i'm reva and and then talking about whatever situation she was in those were generic spots that could run for a year and we send them all to all the affiliates for free and just encourage them to plug them in wherever they could. All of that was meant to build a grassroots effort to make CBS daytime more relatable and get more participation from the audience. And it worked. And uh, and so that was really my big contribution. Does it because it astounds that. me that the, you know these shows, even though I know like you know the shows I worked on weren't owned by CBS, they air on those networks. How do you not have a promo department promoting your lineup? It, it's really mind-boggling to me. And I'm such a dinosaur that I remember when I first started at CBS, they didn't even do a lot of uh, video uh, promos. A promo was a slide put up during a station break saying, tomorrow on Canon, Canon goes and breaks up a bank robbery. It was 15 seconds of a of a voiceover announcer, and I think sometimes they were just as effective as all the expense of making the promos. It, and was Capital just doomed because of the ratings? This is my own feeling. I don't think that show really had the concept to make it work long haul, and I don't think they really managed it well in terms of character development. Mm. Um, to, to, they never to bring, knew if they bring were an audience in. You mean to 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 get us hooked? Yeah, I don't think they ever really made the decision. Are we kind of uh, an inside look at the political world, or are we really a character-based romance group of characters? And it became half of one and half of the other. Um, when they got Jim Lipton to be the head writer toward the end. He's the one I worked with the closest. Um, he was starting to pull it together, but by then it was too late. We had already made the commitment to Bill, and we were going forward with Bold and Beautiful. What 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 do you remember about working with Bill? Uh, I used to marvel at just the sense of humor that he could put into his storytelling. Uh, and yet yank you with emotion whenever he wanted to. That was a real gift. He had such a story mind. He had, he never let on if he was rattled. You, you always felt he was in control, that he knew exactly where he was going. He knew how to pace it and he wasn't gonna waver or make mistakes. 
and he, just, he learned yeah. from the from the queens, you know, from Agnes uh -huh. and Erna. Yeah. yeah we were, well, he had a real brother sister competition with Agnes. Uh, <laughs> he did. I, I when I was set at daytime, uh, I would get the morning rate, the weekly ratings. Yeah, yeah. And we were three hours ahead of L.A., so he would call me on those mornings, and he wanted to know one how his shows did, and the next question was. What did all my children do? <laughs> <laughs> well, and um, it's it's amazing today. Young and the Restless is celebrating the 40th anniversary of Vicky, uh, Victor, and Nikki's wedding. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. wow. So 80, how did you 80. how did you land um, from v, you know from from programming daytime to executive producing? world turns well uh, very topical of the past 12 months i owe it all to a six-month writer strike wow there was a six-month writer strike and of In course, 88. As, head of, as head of daytime i had to keep four shows on the air and um it was the most difficult six months i've ever had professionally it also happened to be a summer where I think we had 35 straight days of 90 plus degree weather. Um, it was really, really hard. And um, I worked like a dog. And at the end of the strike, Bob Calhoun was fried and he said, I don't want to do this anymore. And his contract was up and I had spent the whole summer trying to convince him to stay. And he really didn't want to do it anymore. And so when he made that decision, it wasn't in my life plan, but Ed Trock at PNG came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in taking over World Turns. I think because he had seen what I brought to trying to coordinate everything to get us through that strike. Wow. And um, I think that experience and that skill set set me up to do the executive producing because... Uh, I always had an affinity for working with writers. I, I think that goes from the Twain days. Um, I've always had a special feeling for writing. And uh, and so the relationship I had with Bill Bell and even with Jim Lipton, we had a trust going and a mutual respect. They would take my input because they knew that I was coming to it from a non-competitive basis. I wasn't trying to get my points across. I was just trying to make them better writers and maybe ask some questions that they hadn't considered. And so I took the job and uh, had a great seven years with it. You certainly did. Um, do you recall like what you did first when you got there? And, and Doug was there when you got there, correct? Doug was there. In fact, I went out for drinks with them and I said, Doug, they've got this crazy idea. They want to make me executive producer. How do you feel about that? <laughs> and he said, take it. You know, he, he adored working with Calhoun. Um, they were very close, but um, he, he was complimentary. He said, I, I can't think of anybody better. If we can't have Cal, you'd be great. And so, um, yeah, we did that. Um, those early storylines, we were, the biggest thing was uh, something that Ed Track said was the most masterful introduction of a family of characters he had ever seen in all his years in soaps. It was the introduction of the Snyder family. And I'll tell you how that came about. I loved, every, we were, single, I loved every single one of them, Lawrence. <laughs> every single um, one of them. Yeah. Uh, while we were developing Bold and Beautiful, um, I knew that we needed new writing on As the World Turns. So I had never met Doug Marlin, and as you know, and so I had heard about him. And Procter and Gamble was pretty down on him because things had en ended badly at Guiding Light, and he had gone over to ABC to do Loving with Agnes. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so I reached out to him and asked if he'd meet and put him under a holding deal where he wrote a Bible on spec 
for as the world turns. There was no promise that he'd get a job. I just did it on spec. Procter & Gamble didn't want me to do it, so I used CBS money. And the deal was, if it worked, they would reimburse us for the use of the Bible. And in that Bible was the transformation of Barbara from such a good girl and a victim into somebody who was more formidable and the introduction of the uh, Snyder family and the Douglas Cummings story that uh, was big for Kim and Bob. And huge so, for Kim, huge for Kim, Bob, Julianne Moore, yeah. all of them. Um, you just, oh, Barbara, Colleen sends her love to you. She was going uh, to try and stop by, but couldn't make it work. So she I'm sends so her love. I'm so glad she's on Young and Restless. I, I, it's just a perfect place for her. It is uh, a perfect place. And, and, and the excitement about her was something we have not seen in date time in decades, really, That's about great. her. Because they, they were able to keep it quiet, too. Not they were good. able to keep it. Yeah, they were able to keep it quiet. Um, well, yeah, the Snyders were, you know, all of that that you described, the, the Douglas Cummings, the Snyders, Barbara, you know, changing, which really took her th to the end of the show that way. It, it really gave her new, that character new life because that poor character had been a victim of so many romances that it was kind of like, well, how many more of these can you do before the audience loses interest and gets frustrated because she never learns? And it was Doug who said, I can do this with her, and I know she's got the edge in her that she can bring to this. So I love that her. was his that was his gift. The actors used to say, Do you have microphones in our dressing rooms? Because every time we have a conversation, it shows up on air. It just he had that instinct and he was so close to his characters and he he wrote for actors he he always wanted i think the big thing that explains doug marlin is having been an actor himself he lived to please other actors and so his scripts were gifts to his cast and and they they felt they felt it um, i was right back at him. yeah uh, how devastating was his passing to the show and, and to everyone who adored him? Well, to the entire industry, we lost truly a giant. It was so unexpected, you know, the, uh, he died exactly one week after he and I had been on the air of the Soap Opera Digest Awards, accepting the Lifetime Achievement Award. And, uh, I had been out in California with him that day. We edited a week of breakdowns together and then um, showed up at the hotel for the award ceremony. And after the award and after the telecast, he, we were getting a drink and he said, this is one of the happiest days of my life. I, I just feel so appreciated. And then that was on a Friday night and I flew home Saturday and Monday, I got a call from his assistant because Doug and I would always talk as soon as the show was over and we would, you know, trade notes of what we had done. And she said, Doug's not feeling well. So he asked if maybe you could talk later or, or tonight. And uh, a few hours later, I got word that he was going to the hospital. So I went up to the hospital and I pulled an all nighter. I stayed there while he had an operation and uh, I knew it didn't look good, but they hadn't, they were hoping that they had, you know, fixed the problem. But the next day I went into work and I pulled together a writing team and I said, you guys are going to have to, for, for an interim at least, you're going to have to keep the show on the air. And so we stayed in a room until we thrashed out the first two weeks of storylines. And then it was one foot in front of the other from there. Doug passed away. He had his surgery on Monday night and he passed away on Friday. And uh, of course, it, it was an enormous loss. I, I felt so bad for the actors because I knew how close he had been to them. Our whole company felt it. And, and for me, it was the loss of a true collaborative partnership that um, I had learned so much from him about human nature. 
because he was so character driven that and it it helps me in my work to this day i can read people because i've gone i go we've done this um i've explored this kind of personality because doug had that kind of depth and and inquisitiveness that he could bring to his work so to have all that end so abruptly was uh, just really hard and yeah uh, i think vicky j Vicky just commented, and this really says it all, for us to all know his name shows how impactful he was. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, how did he have a lot of, you know, story in the can at that time? Or were you really left having to? We had story. We hadn't had a full story conference where we worked at you know, we worked about six months in advance. Um, we had pretty good roadmap of where we were going to go with the current storylines. And of course, when you work with Doug Marlin, your discussions are always, well, then that could lead to this. <laughs> <laughs> so even though we didn't have the story structure, we knew directionally where we wanted to go. So uh, working with the writers, um, we were able to put that together it was difficult and we had to create new characters and uh you know put it together but um uh, and they the writers were learning the job of head writer because they hadn't and i had never worked with a team well i had a guiding light but a team of head writers is different than working with one head writer um and so that was an adjustment for all of us but you do what you have to do and i yeah I, I, absolutely is there a storyline that you're most proud of during that period? During Douglas's time? Yeah, or, or dur during your time there. It doesn't have to be Douglas's. A couple. Um, see, one of the things that was important to me, and this comes from my work in specials when I was at CBS, was I mentioned that we did dramatic movies that had social themes. I felt very strongly that I knew from the research department when I was at the network that, you know, your basic soap viewer only watches two episodes a week. So if you're going to increase ratings, you're not likely going to get them from other networks because they're not going to break their habit. You're going to have to increase the frequency with which they watch. And my feeling was women were going into the workforce, more and more people recording at home. If we were going to increase the frequency of our audience, we had to give them something more relevant and topical that they could relate to their everyday lives than what we had been doing. And so I really worked with Doug. He loved doing this, but I, we worked on social themes. So the storylines that meant a lot to me were ones that I know impacted society. Uh, the right to life story we did with Margo pulling the plug ah, Casey. with Casey you can make me cry just thinking about it that storyline was actually thought up by not the storyline it it was uh, um, by Lila she came to me and she thought it would be a great thing if Lila did that and I shared it with Doug <laughs> he he didn't even blink an eye he goes I think Margo should do it and he was absolutely right, because by Margot doing it as a police officer, married to the DA and daughter of the chief of staff of the hospital and daughter of Casey's but, wife, who was right. also a nurse, yeah. it just gave everybody higher stakes. Yes. But doing that story, <clears throat> we researched it, and only one state allowed right to life at that time. It was Missouri. And wow. Doug researched how that law came about and followed the protocols of that law and wrote it into the storyline. And as a result of our doing it, more states got an awareness and started passing legislation. And every actor involved, Bill Shanks, Ann Sward, Ellen Dolan, and Scott Holmes were just incredible. Yeah, I can still remember Ellen's lower lip quivering when she pulled mm -hmm. the plug. It just it it was a great storyline that uh, 
gave all those actors, as you say, a, a wonderful opportunity to act. And I, I, I think it was among our best that we ever did. And Angel's Incest as well. That's the show for which we received the Emmy Award. You know, I was going to ask if you knew which, oh, it was for that. That was the episode, the episode I submitted for the Emmys was the reveal of the incest. Wow. Um, the storyline having been that uh, for years she had been abused by her father. And we had read a Newsweek article that said that in so many cases of incest, other family members know, but they're afraid to speak up. And so he did that with the brothers and uh, of Henry. I mean, the sons, the angels' brothers, and because uh, they were scared of their father. Um, what, Doug, what was important to Doug was that we not only do that storyline of the reveal of the incest, but that we continue the storyline for at least six months after seeing her go through therapy so that there was hope at the end of the line for her. It, and that, go ahead. I, I'm curious because Jennifer Ash, who played Lily on Loving. Yeah, um, six storyline of it. They, they, di they didn't um, continue it there. I think it was cut short because she told me ABC was doing a movie of the week and they didn't want it in both places or something like that. But I and Doug was there, so I'm curious if that's why he really wanted to make sure this story played it out. Could, he never mentioned that, but it could well be. But yeah, uh, we did do that, and that's what got the letters that touched me I'm, the most from our I'm audience. Sure, I got so many letters from people saying, "When I saw Angel speak up, I got the courage to finally speak up." and you've changed my life. And those are the things that, going back to 1934 Communications Act, were serving the public. Wow. Were you involved in the Hank Elliott story as well? That, that story was in midstream when I took over as executive producer. So yes, I'd been involved for, as VP at daytime to encourage Doug to write it. It was the first storyline where an AIDS patient actually was a male. <laughs> um, and uh, I came in and produced the end of that storyline. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I remember, I remember that well as well. Um, during, I, I would assume your time there as well. I mean, Andy's alcoholism, the Kim, yep. Bob and Susan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they weren't thrilled with it at the time, but. <laughs> I still, I'm glad we did that storyline. I think it was good. For well, the Bob and Kim were, and Don and Kathy, right? Or or Marie as well. No, Marie was fine. Yeah. But Don and Kathy, more Don, because he, he, he was smart enough to say, you're going to put us back together, and then that's it. You know, <laughs> you, you can't break us up again. So um, they were none too thrilled on that level. But, but they had fans. great access. Out of it. Fans ate it up. The fans yeah. ate it up. They yeah. it absolutely. Um, you also lost Michael David Morrison during that time. Well, that Halo. was just uh, that was a week before we lost Doug. A week before. I was in Italy scouting the location in Amalfi for a remote that Doug had written. And he was supposed to join us on the shoot, but I got the call. I had flown from New York overnight and I landed in Rome and I got the call when I got to the hotel because we didn't have cell phones in those days. Um, and uh, Vince called me and said, Michael died. And uh, so we had had Graham Winton fill in for Michael during some time. So I said, see if Graham's available. And, and we got him in there. But yeah. Uh, that was a very painful experience because um, I really, you don't like to see a, a, anyone in the kind of pain that Michael was in. Michael was in, and he was such, such a talent. He was a talent. When we put him on tape for that role, Cal was the uh, producer of the show at the time. 
he directed the talent tests. And he came into the booth when he gave Michael notes. And then we went to the tape to, to tape the audition. And he said, um, and I told Scott this uh, a couple of weeks ago. He said, this kid, the only other actor I've ever seen like this is Scott Bryce. He says, this kid, if you tell him to play it green, he'll play it green. He'll give you whatever you ask. And uh, Michael did have that talent. He could just, uh, he could do it uh, and, and do it well. He had had a hard time and he, he really struggled. He really wanted to turn his life around and it, it ultimately just, it was too oh. much for him. But we had, our, our company had done a lot to try to get him through that. And uh, I, I was devastated. I'm happy to hear that the company did. Um, finally in 2018, my husband and I made it to the Amalfi Coast. Oh because, really? Because thanks to you, that had always been a dream of mine since that <laughs> since that story played out on As the World Turns. Like wow. be, because what you put on air just invited every viewer you know <laughs> wanting to go and experience that beautiful you know piece of italy and uh that's I loved what it. we wanted to do i'm so glad to hear that we uh you know what when, when you get to do a remote it's a real treat and you have to save up your money i i squirreled away production money to make that remote happen and when i told doug okay i think we got the money now where you want to go he says, I want to go to Italy. And my grandfather was from Amalfi. So I wow. said, well, what do you think about Amalfi? And he said, his eyes lit up. He, he said, <laughs> yes, let's do it. And so that's that's how that came about. Wow. Who are some of um, the castings that you're most proud of during your EP run? I'm proud of just about every one of them. I, I really don't pick favorites, but just the ones that run through my mind. I had great fun with uh, Renee Props, who played Ellie. Fantastic. Uh, she was a different spark to that family. Um, she was kind of, I think she was the last Snyder to come aboard. Um, I, I think that, you're right. I think when I was talking to Jennifer, I think that was, uh, that came up. Yeah, Jennifer was already there. I think Ellie was the last one. And the same day we cast Ellie, we did the talent test for Cal, which was Patrick Tovat. Fantastic. So those were the first two roles I cast. And I felt, well, now if I could do that <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Um, yeah. Alice and you was, did and you did Brooke Alexander as we discussed backstage. Brooke Alexander, absolutely. And, uh, you know, at one point, just this was more Vince than me, but um, at one point we had Philip Bosco, Claire Bloom, Robert Vaughn, all in gay part characters on that show. Another character who was great fun casting was uh, Tess, which was Parker Posey. Uh, yes. Um, we couldn't cast that role. It was uh, Hal's niece from rural Kentucky, which never <laughs> computed with me because Hal didn't have a Southern accent. But um, we couldn't find anybody who could convincingly play that role. And we had gone to Chicago, Los Angeles, and exhausted New York. And finally, I just said to Vince, you know, it's kind of the end of college season because it's the spring. What about going to SUNY Purchase and some of the local colleges and see if the drama schools have anybody? So SUNY Purchase, in a station wagon, sent down five girls for the part. And Vince read them in his office. One was Puerto Rican. <laughs> and there were three others. And then there was Parker. And he read them all. And then he brought them in to read for me in the office. And... I held Parker afterwards and I started talking to her and I, I said, so this girl, you know, she's from rural Kentucky and you can kind of see she's kind of white trash and, and whatnot. I said, can you relate to that? And she goes, oh, easy cheese. And she put her feet on my desk 
And she had an Elvis Presley cigarette lighter that she kept flipping open and closed, open and closed. And I just fell in love. And uh, <laughs> that is amazing. So, I love that. She love that. That was on a Friday. She started on Wednesday. And about two weeks later was the daytime Emmys where we received the best drama. Best show. And CBS was carrying a it was the very first time the daytime Emmys were in primetime. And what CBS did was they got three of their ingenues who had recently joined their shows to be the statue girls who handed the statues out. So for that award, it was Parker. So now Parker had only been on our show three years, three weeks. She hadn't even hit the air yet. And wow. they announced the award and I go up there to get it. And I see Parker in this party dress that she clearly was uncomfortable in jumping up and down in excitement like a flea <laughs> and i grabbed her and i hugged her and in her ear and you can hear it on the tape i said easy cheese parker easy cheese and she goes, yes yes easy cheese so. that is amazing i have to ask before i let you go um the late elizabeth hubbard and helen wagner some memories yeah. to share uh, <laughs> Uh, couldn't have been different, <laughs> those two. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say <laughs> night and day. Ellen with her white gloves and <laughs> Liz with her sunglasses upstaging every scene. Um, both wonderful actresses, and, and uh, I enjoyed both of them uh, on, on several levels. Helen, of course, I had great respect for because she delivered the first line of that, of that show. And Helen's career actually bookmarked the entire industry of television because I don't know if you know it, but in the 1939 World's Fair, which is the first demonstration of television, she was an on camera model. Ah, I might so have known that, but I, I didn't remember. She that. actually gave birth to television. Um, and then when she got on to World Turns as the first delivering the first line. So I always had a an appreciation of that at our 35th anniversary party which we blew a quarter of a million dollars at the rainbow room <laughs> those don't happen anymore <laughs> no they, they didn't happen during my 13 years there either wow a lot of that money, a lot of that money was put up by tv guide but we had oh, the wow. whole rainbow room we had entertainment we had five different food stations each with a different international flavor and I had kept secret that I had developed a new uh, credit opening and a new theme song for the show. But I tipped off Helen and I gave her an advanced copy of it. And I asked her to practice with her husband to dance to it. <sighs> so when it came time for announcements that night, I asked the audience if they could please clear a space in the dance in the room in the center. And then we played, and I said, Helen, would you and your husband, Bob, please honor us oh, with a dance? God. And she went out there, and the two of them danced for 30 seconds, the, theme, the new theme song of As the World Turns. And then I said, just as she ushered in the first line of the first episode, she's now ushered in our new theme song, which will be on the air in a couple of weeks. Oh, wow. That is incredible. Yeah. I, I Liz? Liz, you just wanted to write for. You wanted to find something new for that character to get into because you just knew that she was going to take it places that you couldn't even conceive. And I just, I, I loved that about her. Well, I should have said when I said the late Liz and Lisa Brown, I mean, what you put, what you gave those two women in that, yeah. you know, story was pure. And Martha, to, you know, all of them yeah. together and Bill Fickner. Billy Fickner added a lot to that too. I mean, all of them just, uh, and that was just inspired casting. The, I'll tell you quickly <clears throat> for Liz's character. Now this is back when, before I was even VP of daytime, I was working with Gene Rennick. We had gone to a story conference and we were very frustrated with what we had done that day. And we had a second day scheduled for the next day. And we went out to a Chinese restaurant and Gene was just going, we've got to think of something big. They're just not thinking of big things. Well, we had Craig who had just burned down the refuge, which was 
a, a runaway place in, in town. And uh, he had served time in jail. So the character was kind of damaged. And so I, they were thinking of even getting rid of him because they didn't know if it was too damaged. And it's like, you can't get rid of Scott Price. So we had Lily, and Lily was just this gangly 13-year-old and Liz, but we hadn't had any kind of storyline. And I made the suggestion that Lily was a black market baby and that Lucinda had been keeping that a secret all these years. And then the thing for Sierra was I said, he's got to do something heroic. Let's send him to a third world nation where he rescues a girl from a revolution. Bianca. We, no, it was Sierra. Oh, he re, he rescued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And Sierra yeah. turned out to be Lucinda's other daughter. Daughter, yes. The writers came up with that aspect. I only came up with the idea of having Craig save a damsel in distress in a third world nation. But uh, that's what... Uh, and it was all inspired by we had to do something for Scott and for Liz. We had to find those storylines that would really. You you had incredible talents for sure. Well, um, that's what it's all about is you get inspired by the actor to say, how can we. It's all about growth. It's growth for the audience. They need to see the characters grow in order to stay hooked. And so you're always looking for what haven't we done? Another quick example is the, uh, the literacy storyline we did for Helen. Helen, with Lauren I Helen. had read in the original Bible that Procter & Gamble never had the Bible for, as the world turns. I'd been asking for it for years, and a friend found it while doing research on Erna at the University of Wisconsin, because that's where Erna donated her papers. So she mm -hmm. sent it to me, and I was reading it, and it was going, Helen's backstory was that um, she had been a, an English teacher. So I asked Helen, I said, were you ever, Nancy, ever an English teacher? She goes, you know, I think Erna mentioned it, but we never did anything with it. So when I gave that to Doug, he came up with the idea. We had a runaway place. We'd have a runaway who had a secret. And Helen, oh, Nancy, who had volunteered there, found a way to uncover that secret that she couldn't read or write, and that's why she ran away. And she taught her literacy through hip hop and rap. And uh, that girl was Lauren Hill. Incredible, incredible. Uh, bef before we really go, um, is there a best recast or, or, or one you're really happy? Because it really, you know, I, I say to, Casting also only works if the story's there for that person to succeed, mm -hmm. really, because yeah. it, it, they, the people will fall if there's not story to help us fall in love with that character. The most successful recast I probably had was putting Ellen Dolan in to replace Hillary Bailey Smith. Doug was morose when we finally lost Hillary. He said, we'll never replace her. And I re remembered Ellen from Guiding Light and I suggested her and he says that's the first name I've heard if we could get her that could really work and I made her audition I didn't want her to feel that she just was handed it so she had to audition with other people but she did it so well and she brought new qualities to Margot but it was a really successful recast because we were able to take that character in many ways. And, I, uh, I adore and her. Mar Margot and Tom's relationship changed and deepened because of the chemistry with Scott and uh, Ellen. Uh, yeah, th they were magic. It, it, it's a shame we didn't write for them towards the end of the show like they should have been written for because they yeah. really were two incredible talents. I loved Mary Ellen Stewart too. I mean, because, you know, replacing Julianne is a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. but. It was. And uh, right then, I, I, I remember in the story, I put my foot down. I said, we're not doing dual roles here. We're casting <laughs> only. <laughs> That's it. Um, 
And yeah, it was good that we found Mary Ellen because she she did a nice job with that. She did it, yeah, with the whole yeah. Lawrence, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for for you know sharing your memories with all of us. Thank you. It's been fun. I really enjoyed you, it. You you were really there at a at a golden period, and and you know, for for this fan and all the fans watching, um, it it was gold. You, you know, when you left. We're, Last question, did you ever want to do it again? I mean, because I know that that job, having spent 13 years on both shows, uh, what an EP is responsible for is is not, not humanly possible for, for longevity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I did not. I had lived with those characters for 12 years, and I'd had the arc experience of starting to find us doing stories with babies that had born, been born during my tenure. I was now doing them with those babies that I had done with their parents. And I was wow. thinking, well, it's logical for this to end. I was only going to stay for another year anyway. I told Procter & Gamble that because my contract was coming up. And uh, no, I was blessed to work with Doug Marland and that cast and also the group that never gets the credit. We had a staff that was second to none on that show. So professional and so talented. And I just didn't feel like I would want to recreate that anywhere else. I wanted to get into other things because I had other things I wanted to do. And so I was perfectly happy to, fortunately, it worked out with a number of things that I was able to do. So no, I wouldn't you, go back to it. You've had great success. Thank you again, Lawrence. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Alan. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you to Lawrence Queso for spending the hour and looking back at his time in Oakdale. Please join me next week for an incredible lineup of guests. On Wednesday, actor Richard Beacons, who played Jamie Frame on Another World, and on Thursday, Golden Globe nominee Mel Harris, who you will all remember from 30-something, joins me to discuss her new movie, Queen of Knives. And then on Friday, I will be reunited with Disney legend Andreas Deha, who spent 30 years animating some of your favorite Disney characters. I was lucky to work with him during my time in PR for Disney. He will be here to discuss his directorial debut on his new animated short film, Mushka, A 10-Year Labor of Love. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And remember, you can stream The Locker Room on your favorite streaming platform. Just search The Locker Room. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. And as always, please stay safe.